Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Yi Kang, and with my co-speakers, Ariel and Marina, you're going to not make the same mistake that we made or learn from our mistakes. So uh, we're, we're, we're uh, three of us are data scientists from Capital One. And starting from a few years ago, Capital One has committed to make substantial investment in the cloud, in the public cloud computing and open source software in order to run all our business critical functions and processes and models. So to that end, we wanted to get our analysts to learn and use Python. And the, starting from a few years, oh sorry, so we have some hard lessons learned uh, that are along the way that may not be strictly obvious to people who are not in the business of teaching people to use Python for their day job. So a lot of us are very experienced practitioner of Python language and we love Python, that's why we're here at PyCon. But imagine a scenario where you wanted to teach Python to a new group of people in your new workplace or your uh, new research lab who have not seen any programming language before and may not have the technical background to learn a new language from scratch on his or, home, or her own initiative. So how do we go about solving that question? I have some AV issues. Ah, okay. So for those of you who are not familiar with Capital One, the company, we're one of the biggest banks in the United States. We'd like to imagine ourselves as a bank a technology company would build. We specialize in a few financial service products such as credit cards, auto finance, and banking and savings accounts. We're headquartered in the Washington DC area, just outside in McLean, Virginia. We have business presence in US, Canada, and UK, serving over 45 million customer accounts. We globally have over 47,000 employees, and out of those, more than 9,000 of them are in the technology professionals, and over 2,500 2, analysts, and over 500 data scientists and quants like us who build models and build tools for our business. So to, for the focus of today, we're going to talk about our analysts. And your question might ask, yeah, the first question might be, why do we want to teach Python to our analysts? Why can't we just let them use existing tool that they use? There's three things about Python that we really like that plays well with our analyst workforce. The first one is ease of learning. It has a very easy to understand syntax, although the analysts might not think it that way, but. <laughs> Compared with other programming languages, it's relatively easy to understand. It has a battery-included philosophy, which means that it comes with a very powerful standard library that can do already a lot of things out of the box. And if you're not satisfied with the standard library, you have a access to an extensive ecosystem of other libraries that can help you do things that you need to do. And it comes also with a series of notebook-like tools, which exposes very powerful computing environment to analysts who are not familiar with programming. So that's all great. For our analysts who do data processing day in, day out, we use Python for a lot of its data-centric tools, all the way from data ingestion using SQL engines or API interfaces to data wrangling using open source libraries such as Pandas, NumPy, and PySpark to modeling using scikit-learn or uh, XGBoost or uh, TensorFlow, to data visualization with a series of static or interactive visualization libraries that you can choose from. And lastly, this is something that we slowly and beginning to realize how important this is for now that we see the end results playing out a few more years. Because for our stakeholders, to all use and work on the same programming language that drastically speeds up the deployment cost. Like if you imagine a case where people are writing stuff in Python but they have to deploy in Java or people were writing SQL queries in their SQL engine but they have to wrap it in Python somehow, all that translation cost can induce errors and cost time. So if you have everyone from data scientists and analysts to software engineers working on the same language that slows, uh, that speeds up the deployment. 
And it also is, is compatible with open source and public cloud DevOps and tooling, which we, our engineers really like. So what do our analysts do day to day? And this is a question that can be best summarized as we they analyze data. They use data to solve business challenges and to find new opportunities. So they do a lot of things outside of data, but let's focus on what they do with data in this slide. The first one they do is a lot of business monitoring. We have a uh, vibrant business that needs a lot of analyst workforce to keep an eye on to make sure we don't screw up. So routine business monitoring may include questions like how many people applied to our credit card last week or last month or last quarter, how many people applied to which credit card and on which application channels and stuff like that. And outside of routine monitoring, people need to answer ad hoc questions like why did this particular zip code has much more application than a year ago, what was happening there? Is it a potential for a fraud attack, for example? And the analysts are also responsible for doing a lot of the data management to make sure the quality of the data and the quality of the metadata is up to enterprise standards. They have to communicate the data risk to non-data people. So uh, on top of that, they are also expected to upscale as necessary, so use the right tool for the job, even if it requires using new tool. So the point of this slide is that they have a lot of um, stuff on, they have, have to do on their plate already. So what we're trying to get to them from a traditional workflow in this table from the left, and someone coined it as a Microsoft Office stack, is that you start from a relational database that hosts your raw data. You interact with the raw data using SQL libraries in some uh, graphical user interface. You query the data, you copy and paste the query results to Excel, you make some plots, you make more uh, wrangling to the data, and then you copy and paste the plot you make Excel to PowerPoint. And if you want to get really fancy, you might even make a Tableau dashboard out of it. In this entire process, you can see that every step is manual. It's very prone to errors, and we can give a whole talk about the errors, the funny errors that people have made not realizing it during the years. But on the right-hand side is the Python-based workflow, where in the data storage, not only do they have the option to get relational databases data, they can also get like, other data sources, such as NoSQL databases and polycloud file storage that are in Avro or Parquet format. They can get the data using query, but they can also package their query in reusable notebooks and Python scripts so that they can share it more easily and run it over and over again. They have the data wrangling uh, libraries that are like Pandas, PySpark, and Dask. They have data visualization options that include static, interactive, or dashboard-like visualizations. And all of that can be automated using open source libraries as well. So all of us in this room would agree the right column is the right way. So, but, but what can go wrong when we try to do this to the analyst? When we want to convince them, hey, Python is really the right way to go. So the first thing we have to realize is that a lot of our workforce may not have the technical background or programming background to learn a new language from scratch. So learning something from scratch with the goal of making it productive in their day job is a daunting task. They do have a lot on their plates, as I mentioned earlier. So having them using Python or learning how to do Python may mean taking things away from their day job, which their managers or their Team where, uh, teammates may not appreciate. And lastly, it's also not just about Python, the programming language and syntax. In order to get productive in Python in their day job, they also have to learn other concepts, such as uh, how to run scripts from a Unix command line, how to check in your code into GitHub so it's open source, or sorry, it's source controlled and can be shared with other people on your team and even outside your team, and how do you run things from the cloud, spin up instances so that your script is not dependent on some analyst's laptop that has to be turned on at a certain time in the day. All these concepts are necessary for them to get pro productive. So to that end, I want to turn it to Ariel to discuss the materials that we have for teaching analysts to, do, to use these tools. Thanks. Yeah, how many of you guys have ever tried teaching a novice programmer Python? Wow, a lot of you. How many of you guys did it end in tears for? 
A few hands, yeah, I've seen some tears. Um, <laughs> when when we, we obviously want to teach Python to these people, but and, and we live in a world with infinite training available, right? So we're really lucky in that way. Um, but it's a really daunting task nevertheless. So we use the fact that there's so much great content out there to really focus on relevancy and engagement, try and get people's buy-in from the beginning. And we try to do that through customization. So as part of an organization we called Big Data Academy, on the left here, we tailored our content towards the analyst and quant community, who typically have good business sense, modeling background, maybe not so much software engineering fundamentals. And we let other organizations in the company, like Tech College, kind of cater to that more technical audience. And we let them take care of the, uh, the stuff where maybe they need a little bit more math stats uh, fundamentals in their courses. And in general, the workflow that we try to follow is just to keep this audience in mind and then select and filter context based on, uh, fil filter the content that we wanted to include based on that audience. And then think about presentation and interaction modes that would be appropriate. And then add a little bit of Capital One flavor, you know, a little bit of spin based on the unique way that we have to get things done inside this corporation. And so one example of this is, you know, we decided to have the content in Big Data Academy be self-paced content that you could go through kind of on your own time, partially because of what Ekong said about how people have very demanding schedules in the uh, BA community, analyst community. And so what we ended up with looks something like this. This is a curriculum which has kind of a foundational level on the top, which leads into more analytical courses uh, in the central piece. And there's some auxiliary material as well. Uh, Python features very heavily in this curriculum from the very beginning. And in all, we had 18 self-paced courses here. Uh, they were created and maintained largely by volunteers, which is great. Um, and all of them were pretty much hosted on GitHub pages, I think. So that was also great. Um, we really wanted to engage the community, and we really wanted analysts to use GitHub. So check, check. But a little secret is that we actually kind of needed both of those things to happen in order to scale to the number of people that we wanted to take this content. If we didn't have the crowdsourcing, if we didn't have um, kind of GitHub as this uh, platform for doing self-paced learning, it would have been very hard for us to get the number of completions that we did. And so completions are kind of this one metric that we measure, maybe not the best, but we, as of March, we had over 8,000 from about 3,000 uh, associates. And we know that from our analytics, there's a lot more people who kind of use the content as a reference. They kind of open it up, check something out, copy some code, and then uh, close the site. So uh, all in all, this was a, an approach that gained a lot of traction. So what I want to segue into is talking about some of the lessons we learned along the way as we deployed this curriculum and kind of experienced what it was like. Um, the first lesson really requires putting yourself in the shoes of one of these analysts and thinking back to when you were first learning Python and then tacking on to that, to those circumstances, uh, a full day job, like Ekong was saying, significant time constraints, maybe a lot of money on the line, somebody breathing down your neck, somebody waiting for the result of your analysis. You know, <laughs> and then somebody comes along and says, by the way, you should be doing things completely differently. And, uh, and, and you're like, okay, well, when, when am I going to do that? Um, in a world of infinite training, you know, we don't have infinite time. And it can be hard to learn something just for the sake of learning it. I know that at conferences like this, you know, I kind of love the break. I use it to like dig into a whole bunch of the GitHub repos that get posted. And then I go back to my real job and I'm like, oh, I really want to finish like making that JavaScript visualization. But, you know. Um, so, so how can we kind of, you know, how can we kind of tackle this? The symptom of this problem is really, I think, uh, at its core, is that it sucks to be the only person. It sucks to be alone. It sucks to be the only person trying to learn Python um, or using Python on your team. Uh, your teammates or manager may not be interested at all. They don't see the value uh, in some cases. And it can be really hard to overcome kind of an organizational inertia. Um, 
you know, many of you are probably familiar with the kind of like manual painstaking task that this comic is trying to describe where, you know, we have this routine monitoring, it has to happen once every quarter, it goes to the regulators, we've got to take some data from like these million SQL tables, make a pivot table in Excel, and then like copy paste a chart into a PowerPoint deck that somebody else will process. Um, and that's just the way it's always been done. Uh, so, like, why, and, and why do we even need Python here? Um, another challenge is that when you're alone, you don't really have a great path forward to learning the best practices that come with Python development. Um, you can maybe look up how to do a particular thing, but you don't necessarily get everything else, everything like version control, like unit tests, like not hard coding your password in your program, like uh, naming variables in this so that can be reusable. Um, and of course, documentation. Uh, so, you know, you can talk to your rubber duck all you want. The rubber duck is not going to teach you like how to build Sphinx docs and how to like format doc strings and functions. So when you're alone, it's really, really daunting to kind of break into this path. I mean, we're all on this journey of trying to be better programmers. We know it doesn't happen all at once, but even just to take that one next step of like, I have something in a Jupyter notebook, let me make it into a function, that can be hard to do when you're by yourself. So we tried to build a community. We tried to build a community from the ground up and create a support system that analysts could be a part of outside of their immediate team. We used something called the Analyst Development Program. It's a cohort-based thing we do um, every year. And each new batch of analysts goes through it. We put Python like front and center in that program so that they could kind of go through the process together. And we also tried to enable cross-functional collaborations between analysts and other kind of job, uh, related technical job families at the company. Of course, we had support from the highest levels. That really helps a lot. Like It helps to have that backing, it helps to have that keynote speaker at the first, on the first day of the program saying, hey, you guys should learn Python. Like that goes a long way. But at the end of the day, the bottom up community is I think where the real value is. And key to this is teaching, uh, teaching these analysts how to extract value from that community, right? It's very easy to say, hey, be in this community. Um, but you know, what are they gonna get out of it? And largely, I think we, we centered our efforts there around GitHub and Slack. Um, we had a lot of kind of self-service support through GitHub. Like I said, we wanted people to use GitHub, so we were like, you should make an issue, you should make a pull request. Let's talk about the problems you're having alongside the code. Um, and then Slack is simply, uh, it simply answers a lot of the pain points that we had. You know, we, we could have done this in something other than Slack, but if you think about some of the common problems you may have, like uh, I don't know who to ask the question to in the first place. Well, you know, there's a little thing over there that's like questions, try asking, Steven, Python guru. <laughs> um, or, you know, maybe somebody is really tired of answering the same question over and over again about how to write a conda environment.yaml file. Like we could have a pinned item in the Slack channel. Or, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, or, you know, something that's happened to me a bunch is you just need somebody to screen share with and let's get you through this one roadblock you're having. And if you like squint at this screenshot, there's like a little phone, uh, little phone call button up here. And that actually like triggers a video call with somebody. So you can actually like get help, get some value out of this community. So the Slack channel is very active. We have a lot of questions and answers going on there all the time. Um, the second thing I want to tell you about is, you know, system setup issues, dun, dun, dun. Um, if you looked at that Slack screenshot, I, I would wager that like a significant fraction of those messages were related to help, I mean, I can't install Python on my Windows machine, or um, you know, I tried to install this thing and it didn't work. And for any of you who, like me, have worked in like technical support, you know, we've probably experienced some version of this haiku I like to recite it every now and again because it's just so <laughs> emblematic of the kind of conversation that you end up having so often. It's not the proxy. It cannot be the proxy. It was the proxy. <laughs> and uh, you, can, you can replace proxy with DNS or you know, anything that, that you know, is kind of a, a bugbear for this kind of uh, environment setup. 
and, and really the thing is that our associates are really self-sufficient and resourceful and that leads them to create solutions to these problems which they then share with their friends and their friends share it with their friends in this copy-paste kind of game of telephone and you know, it gets outdated and then somebody's system is borked in some like insane way that you've never seen because you just joined the company 18 months ago. Um, I've seen like dot bash rc dot text files and trying to figure out like why that doesn't, like why is this not working? Um, so that's the problem. Uh, our solution was to really take setup out of the learner's hands as much as we possibly could. Um, we got better at this over time, I think. Uh, we started out trying to do things like pre-install Python on people's la on a, a bunch of like loaner laptops and then hand them out to people. And that works, uh, but does it meet our scalability criteria? No, obviously, we can't keep doing that. So we started doing things like using a centralized place to store uh, all of the setup information as best we could and be vigilant about updating it regularly. And that was good too, if time consuming for us. So. I think really what the next level thing to do here is, in our case, is to leverage shared analytical environments. And we use these pre-canned Linux sandboxes that we can just spin up. They have taken care of all of the setup issues. You know, they have the git command uh, already in the terminal. They have the proxy solution already in place. And the courses that we want to run can have startup scripts that kind of handle data retrieval, permissions, GitHub interactions, things like that, so that the learner basically presses a button and it's like, do, 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 okay. And, and really, I think that's the bottom line here is that for experienced practitioners, you spend maybe 1% of your time fiddling with the setup and 99% of the time, you get to have fun. But for somebody who's really new, it's completely flipped. They spend, they spend the majority of the time just trying to get the thing working in the first place and then like that little piece of the course at the very end, that's when they get to have fun. And so that's, that really sucks. So um, I wanna hand it over to Marina to talk more about like how we can really get adoption of Python going. Thanks, Ariel. So making the setup easier definitely helped more people to start the courses. But remember, our goal is much more ambitious than that. We wanted people not only to start the courses, but to actually be more productive in their work. So we want them to complete the courses and, more importantly, use what they have learned in their day-to-day -day work. Sounds tricky, right? So let me start with what can go wrong here and take a look at this example of situation that can occur in real world. Here, a proud analyst just completed her Python training, and she feels that she knows everything there is about iterators, generators, decorators, classes, inheritance, and all the other jargon that she was so afraid just a few weeks ago. And she feels that she's ready to tackle all the big data problems and make data-driven decisions using artificial intelligence. While in the reality, even though her manager is very supportive of her training, she can be asked to connect some dashboard to a database, something not related to Python and boring and, you know, just old way of doing things. And it makes sense. Uh, just because you have learned Python doesn't mean that all the processes will be automatically translated into Python. And of course, you still have your day-to-day work that you need to complete. Um, and we have seen that in our Python courses. So we had um, those foundation courses for a while, and we have seen that a lot of people start the course, but never finish. Some of them got distracted, some of them just, you know, get stuck. Some of them never bother to complete the final assessment or click complete in the system. Uh, and it can be somewhat similar to MOOCs, um, massive open online courses, although the completion rate for our courses which was much, much higher. And we have, probably all of us have taken some of the MOOCs, right? We go to the system, we saw that the content is interesting, but it requires motivation and time commitment to actually go through the course. And even though if you complete the course or analysts complete the course, uh, there is still a challenge to 
use what you have learned in your day-to-day -day work, especially if you have deadlines. Because imagine yourself being an analyst who need to complete something by tomorrow, and you know how to get it done in the old, maybe manual, but working way. And you may not have all the knowledge and confidence that you need to do it in Python. So how have we addressed that? It may not come as a surprise to you that it's really important to teach what people need to do in their daily work. So, if, uh, so we need to provide people with examples and code cookbooks to actually do what they need to do. So if an analyst needs to create a dashboard, perfect, put together some code to help them do that. Same with automation, visualization, whatever they need to do. And here, it's really important to partner with analysts, both to understand their pain points, because being a data scientist, you may not do what analysts do in their daily work. And uh, it's also important to discover some of the tips and tricks that they may have and uh, try to popularize that with a bigger community. Also, the next thing, um, here at PyCon, we all know and love Python, right? Uh, and we are very excited about the language. We tell other people how awesome it is. And it's great, but it not necessar doesn't necessarily help non-technical people to get it adopted. So it's really important to imagine yourself in other shoes and actually reimagine people's workflow in Python for them. And here we have an example of the course that we put together uh, with help of analysts. Um, so one, anal one analyst uh, went through our foundation courses and he was fascinated by how Python make his work easier. So, but he, he struggled to make other people on his team to use Python. And so we partnered together to put together this content that is focused on their workflow. And people got really good feedback because they were able to you know, take the course and go back to their desk and use what they have learned um, and get the job done much faster. Uh, finally, it, it will not come as a surprise to you that leadership help helps and um, leadership can provide some motivation uh, like prizes or equipment upgrades uh, if you want to drive, uh, you know, Python adoption. And of course, e you can improve on the things that you can measure. So it's, it helps to provide leadership with a view of course completions and some, some measure of adoption in different organizations. Because if you put multiple very successful people on the leaderboard, they would try to get higher. You know, competition is good. Anyway, so this Python for Endless course was definitely a success. But remember, we have thousands of analysts. And uh, all of them are very smart people and creative, and uh, we want them to be able to share some of their, you know, good ideas, good solutions without involvement from our team. So what can go wrong here? Uh, and again, let me start with comics that can depict real-world situation. So here, a proud analyst spent his last, uh, his last week uh, working on, on a script that puts uh, some Excel plots into PowerPoints. And the code works great, so um, she's happy, but she just realized that someone has done that in like 2015. And all discouraged, she like thinks whether the cycle goes on forever and forever. And putting that to the extreme, you can see how, you know, someone can pass over big stacks of SQL queries from generation to generation, right? <laughs> Makes sense. Sounds like a great decision, right? Um, and again, those of you who work at big companies can relate to that. Different people solve the same problems over and over again, reinventing the wheel, reinventing the bicycles, whatever they want. Um, and it's hard to get communication right, especially when there are many people. 
and analysts can easily get siloed and reuse some of the bad scripts and practices in their work because when they have an issue, they go to their immediate team and the solution that they have may not necessarily be the, ba the best and greatest. And we have seen a lot of those in uh, our experience. Finally, um, discoverability is a big problem and there are some good solutions that never get discovered. And you may have, her may have heard some of those phrases like, someone not committing code to GitHub because the code is not ready. Anyone have heard some, something like that? Yeah, perfect. Um, guess what, it's probably never will be ready. Anyway, another, another problem is people may prefer put their wonderful solution in a private repo, so to keep it secret um, because, you know, good solution. Anyway, so how can we address that? First, uh, best practices do help, but it's important not only to use those best practices, but also codify and champion them. And things like cookie cutters and templates can help because um, with cookie cutter, it's much easier to start a um, good project in the way it should be rather than, you know, having analysts trying to figure out how to structure their code so it can be packaged. Uh, it's also important to provide, clear, uh, pr provide gentle yet clear introduction of the best practices. So if someone has just learned Python and has a bunch of hard-coded variables in their code, great, encourage them to put it in a variable. If they have a lot of random repetitive code in notebooks, Fantastic, encourage them to create a function, add doc tests, uh, unit, uh, doc strings, unit tests, and finally, and hopefully make it into a package, especially if it solves a common problem. And in an ideal world, this package will be then open sourced as some of the other projects that we have built. Um, next. We at Capital One really use and love GitHub, and of course, we use it to store code, but it's also important to make it a home for living documentation that can get evolved. Um, and it's really hard to make people write the docs or get excited about the documentation. That's why it's so important to make it easy for people to make the documentation stylish and look cool, and tools like Doxify or you know, creating interactive GIFs really help people to get some pride in writing those docs and share them with other people. And finally, sharing information is great. So different conferences or regular demos help to disseminate the knowledge. So, um, we hope that we didn't get you scared with all the issues that you may face uh, while building a community of practice. Uh, I feel that we've made a wonderful progress, although it's a never ending journey. And we believe that um, Python is super useful to a big group of people. So we do want to finish our talk with some summary, summary of some of the lessons so you can build your community of practice as well and help other people to use Python. So first, um, adoption is definitely easier when you start with a cohort of people. So when a lot of people are together in the room, it's much easier for them to help each other to get unstuck and solve problems together. Although top-down support definitely helps with the resources and incentives. Setup, it will always be a problem but it's important to minimize the problem and cloud uh, and DevOps best practices can help. But it's also important to separate that pain of setup from the joy of programming. Next, advocate for Python, tell how Python is great, but also try to put yourself in other shoes and reimagine people's workflow in Python. And Finally, use best practices in your own coding and provide gentle yet clear introduction of those best practices to others. 
and use cookie cutters and templates. Um, hopefully let give people food for thought and sh hopefully let the sharing of our journey is helpful to other people. If you want, we, all three of us are on the Capital One Data Science team, here's our contact info if you need to reach out to us. And I do want to mention, because our uh, company kindly fly us here, we are hiring, we do have a booth in PyCon, and no, we are not trying to get people to sign up for our credit card in the booth. If you want to do that, go online, but come talk to us. We are hiring for uh, people with Python skills in software engineering, data science, and on job families. We're hiring across the geographical location and experience level. So come visit our booth if you're interested in learning more about working at Capital One. Thank you. All right, so now we're gonna be uh, receiving a couple of questions. The mic is uh, on the corridor at the end. Hi. So um, we have an analyst community that is kind of spread across a, a range of technologies, R, SAS, Excel, um, and then a few people dribbling into Python. And some of the pushback that we've received is if you have people move on to a new language, um, they're going to move on, and then someone's going to have to pick up this. And uh, there's, there's kind of like two schools of thought. Um, we should have everyone standardized to what we've always been doing, which is maybe something more in the SaaS realm versus and like not let anyone go into this new thing. Or the second school of thought is kind of like encouraging something more in your direction. I'm just curious if you guys have any um, feedback uh, or learnings around that or if that was something you experienced in your company. Is a question around surround, like picking a standard language that people use or? So part of it is um, if, if the team uses a mix of Python, R, and SAS, right, so that you have one Python person and then they move on to a new job, how do you have your team pick up that code, right? So do you, do you enforce standardization across your teams or do you say, like, you know, you're, you're just going to kind of have that, that uh, you know, extra work that needs to be done in order to team catch up on that code? Yeah, um, we actually, I mean, I think at any kind of larger company, you end up with these pockets of expertise and you have some really well-established Java code base over here. You might have a really established SAS code base over here. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to move people to Python is that um, it is, I think, easier to go into somebody's old kind of Python code and kind of decipher what's going on than, um, than in other languages. Maybe that's my own opinion, but, um, that's something that we've seen. Um, and so that's like one reason to kind of standardize on Python. I think another part of your question is kind of, um, I see it through the lens of people's development. And like, if we're gonna imagine ourselves as a tech company that just happens to, does bank, happens to do banking, then we should develop people in terms of the, t the relevant tech skills of today and tomorrow and, and all of that. And so if we see analysis kind of moving towards cloud solutions, if we see things moving towards um, Python, then we want to like get people using that. Like even if it's going to make us spend some admittedly painful uh, time, kind of migrating things from the old way of doing things to the new way of doing things, and and that's one of the areas where I think the top-down support is is especially helpful because we can have people like our CEO come and say we are all moving to Python, we are getting off SaaS, and then you know it kind of like gets everybody on board real quick. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'll yeah. just have, have to have your CEO call my CEO. <laughs> so I really enjoyed the, uh, the page that you had up that listed out all of the templates and sort of common um, upvoted code in GitHub, for lack of a better phrase. I think something that we're encountering, and, and I'd love to sort of hear how you're thinking about this, is what are you planning sort of as more people create templates and more people create patterns of work um, thinking about like when there are thousands or tens of thousands of notebooks committed to GitHub, how are you thinking about making sure that the most relevant and um, ideal solutions are easily found in your community? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a very good question. I would say that if 
if, even those notebooks are well documented, so people can understand what actually is happening there, then search over GitHub works pretty good and people can just search for relevant projects and you know get inspired by some of the some of the solutions so yeah my answer would be better document and life will be better uh, yeah I would, I would just add it's pretty similar to just open source software in general I think um, you know how do we find the relevant things that are out there and and we would like to have some internal version of Stack Overflow, an internal version of Google, an internal version of, I mean, the search is not always the best. If you've used Slack search, you know how easy and fun it is to find things that happened in the past. Um, but, you know, we, we do want to have some sort of aggregation that's basically like, you know, by topic or something like that. And people are working on those things, you know, but that, that is, a, a, I guess, still a constant struggle. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I have a question about different languages that people might want to use. I know like some examples in R, um, when some analysts are doing very statistics heavy modeling, um, R might be better than Python, and some of the Python packages can't even keep up yet at the moment. Um, is, your, is your approach at Capital One to kind of say, really use Python unless you have very specific cases not to use it, or is it a little more flexible, in ter especially in those edge cases? Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, just as a person who also uses R and works with people who use R, um, I would say, I mean, we embrace both. Of course, like Python is awesome for many reasons, but, you know, there are some packages in R with some fancy statistical methods that don't have its, you know, similar, similar its anal analogs in Python. And, I mean, it, it's, it's usually like a team makes a decision what language do they want to embrace. Also, with some clever pipelining and good core code organization, it's easier to you know, pipeline different, uh, different programs altogether. Um, so, yeah, I hope that gives you some sense of Python versus R. Thank you so much. We have space only for one last question. I'm sorry, we can uh, continue. I yeah, guess you can pick a meeting on the corridor, yeah. but yes. Yeah, thanks a lot for the great talk. So I had a, a question. Since you're, it seems like you're now using a lot of external open source uh, tools. How do you handle updates on those tools? Especially when you now have an, a group of internal analysts who are building some things on top of them that may not be compatible between versions, and also who may not be trained software engineers who are really ex experienced with uh, version bumps. That's a great question. But I, w I would point out that many of our analysts use tools that are pretty widespread and standard, things like SQL Alchemy, things like Pandas, things like Matplotlib and uh, Bokeh or stuff like that, that doesn't have nearly as big of a deal in terms of version updates. And we do see some of those conflicts or issues when, for example, some of our data or data science team pick a particular library that hasn't been updated for two to three years, and then we still have an ongoing product support for an existing internal project, what do you do then? I feel like I don't have a very good solution to that, but I, I do want to know that it is something that we are also experienced a pain point of, and we are trying to learn from experience of picking, like which, how, how you pick your stack is important, and there's risk when you're picking a stack that ended up not getting updated. Sorry that if the answer is not very satisfying, but <laughs> it's something they're also trying to deal with. And make sure to like fix the versions for packages in the environment. And we encourage like for whatever projects people are working on to fix those versions, just because there are so many errors that can be caused by that. But yeah. And I'll just add in the last 10 seconds. Um, <laughs> It actually is really tempting sometimes to use some of these more niche packages that kind of solve a very particular use case. And we found that actually just minimizing the dependencies um, prevents this problem from coming up as often. So while there may be some cool stuff out there to handle you know, some, some, something very close to what they're doing, if they stick with the more well-trodden path, then the version update thing doesn't bite as often. So 
that is one tangible thing you can do is kind of take a hard look at the uh, requirements.txt or environment.yaml and make sure that you know you absolutely need these things. Yeah. All right. Thank you.